your bulletin, there is a, an outline of the sermon this morning. Also, it has the text in there that we'll be reading in just one moment from Luke uh, chapter 21, and also 1 Timothy chapter 1. Uh, beginning a new series this morning on uh, the title of the series is Lies That Kill. And uh, we're going to explore some of the, some of the things that uh, a lot of people believe that actually are death. Uh, in the spiritual realm, and we need to uh, uh, we need to understand these things. And so, I thought it'd be a good thing for us throughout Advent to look at some of the lies that kill. Uh, in I can't think of a better word, contrast or juxtaposition to the fact of uh, Advent. Of Advent is the bringing of life, isn't it? It's where Jesus came, the bringer of life, the Prince of Peace. Uh, he brought us life. And so we're going to look at lies that kill as in standing in contrast. It's like looking at light and darkness. And I think the two will go together very well. So this morning we want to start off by talking about the false teachers and uh, the fact that we are instructed in Scripture not to believe them. And that's what Luke chapter 21 says. Brian read that and I just want to lift one verse out because it's going to be the theme of uh, basically the whole series throughout Advent. Jesus said to the followers that uh, were listening, Don't let anyone mislead you, for many will come in my name claiming I am the Messiah, and saying the time has come, but don't believe them. Jesus said it pretty simply, didn't he? And in order to uh, understand where truth comes from, we're going to turn to uh, truth as opposed to the lies that we're talking about here. We turn to 1 Timothy chapter 1, the beginning of Paul's epistle, a little letter to, uh, to Timothy, instructing him about a number of things. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 1. This letter is from Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, appointed by the command of God our Savior in Christ Jesus, who gave us hope. I am writing to Timothy, my true son in the faith. May God the Father in Christ Jesus our Lord give you grace, mercy, and and peace. And then Paul begins to, to explain just a little bit about all of his purposes here for writing to Timothy. He said, when I left for Macedonia, I urged you to stay there in Ephesus and stop those whose teaching is contrary to the truth. Don't let them waste their time in endless discussion of myths and spiritual pedigrees. These things only lead to meaningless speculations which don't help people live a life of faith in God. The purpose of my instruction is that all believers would be filled with love that comes from, now here's the, here's the trinity of truth here, that come from a pure heart, a clear conscience, and genuine faith. Now if you've looked at both sides of this sheet, you know where we're going this morning. We're going to center on those three words. Let's hear what the rest of Paul said to Timothy. But some people have missed this whole point. They've turned away from these things and spend their time in meaningless discussions. They want to be known as teachers of the law of Moses, but they don't know what they're talking about, even though they speak so confidently. We know that the law is good when used correctly, for the law was not intended for people who do what is right. It is for people who are lawless and rebellious, who are ungodly and sinful, who consider nothing sacred and defile what is holy, who kill their father or mother or commit other murders. The law is for people who are sexually immoral or who practice homosexuality or are slave traders, liars, promise breakers, or who do anything else that contradicts the wholesome teaching that comes from the glorious good news entrusted to me by our blessed God. False teachers. Jesus said, don't believe them. Paul said there's an antidote. There is uh, a cure for what the false teachers want to share with anybody who will listen. I heard about a second grader who explained what false doctrine is. He said it this way, false doctrine is what happens when sick people get the wrong medicine. Now, that's not very far from the truth of the result of what false doctrine brings. When people are wrongly taught in spiritual matters, they get morally sick. They 
don't know how to act in accordance with God's will. The best medicine is to study God's word because that is where true doctrine is contained. Jesus said to the Pharisees, you study the words because you think you know all about God. And you just, what Jesus was saying is you're just hunting for things that reinforce what you already think you know. He said, but those are the words that testify of me, Jesus said. He said, from Genesis all the way through Revelation, what Jesus was saying is that entire book, that collection of 66 books, that thing that we call the Bible, the Holy Word of God, is all about me. It's all pointing to me, Jesus said. The best medicine is to study God's Word because right doctrine is like an immunization against false doctrine. It's like a cure for being morally sick. <clears throat> the epistles of Paul are full of great insights, uh, great spiritual medicine to help us, if you will. In Paul's day, there were plenty of false teachers to go around. Uh, one of the groups was called the Gnostics. I don't know if you've ever heard that term before. The Gnostics, it comes from a couple of Greek words put together. Gnosis is knowledge. And these are people who loved knowledge. They didn't care to fact check and find out if it was true or not. They just loved having all sorts of knowledge. You find that a lot in academia. Well, the Gnostics were steeped in false belief, but it was just a hair removed from the truth. What happens if you have this much truth and this much error? And you take the whole package together. How much iodine does it take to turn the whole glass of water red? Right? It doesn't take much. You drop a drip of ink into a clear glass of water and you don't have clear water anymore, do you? It's the same thing with doctrine and just a little bit of error. Right doctrine and a little bit of error will make for a whole lot of error. It becomes all wrong. These Gnostics were people who believed in God, they even believed in Jesus, but they saw God as so removed from mankind that there could never really be a personal relationship. You've heard that term, a personal relationship with God, where you can talk to Him one-on-one, -on -one, and He's going to whisper in your ear, He's going to lead you, He's going to show you. These are, these are tenets of our faith. This is what we believe. But the Gnostics, not so. They didn't think a relationship, a personal relationship with God was possible. And since God could not create or touch anything bad like material things or, or humans, this is what the Gnostics thought, they thought that the creation, the only explanation for the creation was when God had like an emanation, like a, you know, an aura go off of him, and that was slightly lesser in deity that went out from him. And from that emanation, from that aura, another lesser emanation flowed. And the emanations got less and less holy, less and less God, until finally at one point, until the deity of God was far enough removed to dabble in things of man's flesh, the evil flesh, according to the Gnostics. And according to their kind of thinking, Jesus was one of those lesser em emanations. He was better and more holy than the average bear, but he was a lot less so than God, according to the Gnostics. Since they considered our fleshly bodies evil, they also dismissed the resurrection of the physical body. Where are we going with this class? We're going right to the crux of the matter of faith in Jesus Christ. We're going right to the cross. We're going right to the tomb. We're going right to Easter morning. Where the resurrection of Jesus took place, how? Oh, he was just a spirit? Or was it something different? Was Jesus raised in spirit or was he his body as well? Thank you, Kathy. It was his body. His bodily resurrection took place. But because of that, I mean, Paul knew such teachers were always on the prowl for converts. He said so in Acts chapter 20 that false teachers like vicious wolves, after Paul left teaching them right doctrine, the vicious wolves would come in with their false doctrines such as this. 
In our day, we have a resurrection of Gnosticism. And at the risk of maybe alienating some of you, at the risk of maybe offending some of you, where is that doctrine most prevalent? There are two denominations that I can point to that are not Christian. They're the Jehovah's Witnesses and Mormons. Neither one of those groups believes that Jesus is God. There are many other groups like them that I'm just pointing out to. You may have friends, you may have family members in those two denominations. You ask them. You ask them if what I'm saying is right here. They do not believe that Jesus is God. They do not believe in the deity of Jesus Christ. And so what does that do to the resurrection? If he was not God raising God, then there is no resurrection. There is no life after life. We also have, in our day and age, New Age teachers who would rather study the emanations that supposedly came out of God than accept the revealed Word of God that tells us who Jesus is. Among the worst of false teachers are those who teach the prosperity gospel. Now listen, I know some of you uh, on occasion probably watch some of that on TV these days where they talk about how everything revolves around whether or not you're going to get rich. Prosperity gospel diverts our attention from the real riches of faith, which God said was much more important than whether or not you worry about getting rich or have material things. What did Jesus say in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 6? He said, uh, don't you worry about the things that you need in your body, what you're going to eat, what you're going to wear. Don't you worry about that. What did he say? He said, seek first the kingdom of God. Faith is more important than whether or not you've got riches, whether or not you've got stuff. So false teachers abound. We need what truth brings. And so what does truth bring? Well, in my book, truth brings encouragement. And that's exactly what Paul was aiming to do with Timothy when he wrote this letter. He left him in Ephesus as a pastor so that Paul could leave that church in good hands and go on to Philippi to check on the church there. This was Paul's pattern. He always picked somebody that he saw the Spirit of God operating in who would teach the truth about who God was. And no matter how big the congregation was or how small the congregation was, no matter how steeped in the Word of God they were or um, steeped in other traditions, Paul picked somebody that he could count on to tell them the truth. The first letter to Timothy is filled with encouraging, strengthening help. Paul called Timothy his true son in the ministry. I don't know about you, but I think what could be more encouraging for a timid young pastor like Timothy than to have the affirmation of a seasoned elder statesman of the faith? Well, God's people need to know how to live like God's people because sometimes we all mess up. Let me let me see your hand if you have never messed up. You mean to say I pastor a church where there's not a single perfect person out there? Wow. What does it mean knowing how to live like God's people? Well, it means knowing how to recognize and deal with the false teaching that's out there because, folks, it is out there. It is out there. And we have more of it available to us right now than ever before. You know what? I, I, I've gotten so accustomed to whipping out that phone of mine when I hear a word that I'm not familiar with. I type in that word. I've got 40 different websites, 500 websites, a million websites that will tell me what that word means. And guess what? Not all of them are right. Hello. Have you discovered that? That there are some errors in the internet, you know? The question becomes, I think for us, is how can I be safe from false teachers? The answer centers around what Paul related to Timothy or revealed to Timothy as the reason that he was writing. Listen to this as I say it one more time. Paul said the purpose whole reason I'm writing to you, Timothy, is that all believers, all these people that you're going to teach, Timothy, would be filled with love that comes from a pure heart, a clear conscience, and a genuine faith. We're going to unpack those three words in the next few minutes that we've got here. But simply stated, what Paul said his whole purpose was, was helping them hit the bullseye of Christianity. 
which is love. Finding the center of a sweet spot of love. Now, Brian understands that word, sweet spot, right? Where, where do you find the sweet spot, by Brian? Well, I don't find it very often. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm on a club, uh, golf club place. But it's right on that golf club, the, the head of the golf club. There's one spot where if you bring the club down and hit that ball, you know you've hit the sweet spot because, man, you don't feel any sting in your hands. It just feels right. I had that once. I've been playing golf for 140 years. It's perfect. It's perfect. That's a sweet spot. And that's what God's love is when we're talking about Christianity. So the things that help keep a believer on track and safe from every kind of false doctrine, from every kind of twit who has a new way of freeing your spirit or being at one with the cosmic presence. Paul said that the one antidote, the one thing that we need to hit as a sweet spot is the love of Christ. And we find that through a pure heart, a good conscience, and sincere faith. Let's unpack that for just a moment. You notice on this outline here, we've got a little uh, icon of a target, just like you'd shoot at with a bow, right? Uh, or maybe you've played darts before. Let me ask you a question. Where are the most points to be found on that target? The bullseye, right? That's the middle spot. And the further away you get from that middle spot, the less and less the points, right? But I want you to think about it this way this morning as we unpack this for the next few minutes. What we're going to be talking about is not moving away from the bullseye, but moving towards the bullseye. Entrance into Christianity, entrance into the faith begins at the outer ring. You don't hit the bullseye immediately. You may try, but you'll never hit it. Because the center of God's love can only be found at the entry point. So, with that, keep that in the back of your mind. Let's start at the outer ring. What is it, according to my little outline here, is the outer ring. It's a pure heart. That's the first thing that Paul says, that he wants us to have a pure heart. Well, the spiritual heart is the center of who you are, emotionally, uh, spiritually, with your will, with your mind. This is where all of your decisions are made. And a pure heart will make pure decisions. Our physical heart, this uh, thing, muscle that's beating inside each of us. You do have one beating inside of you, don't you? I mean, if not, you know, we need to rush you to the, to the meds right away. Uh, the spiritual heart is the center of your will and emotions and mind. Uh, and, and this is where you make your decisions. Our physical heart makes a biological life possible, but the spiritual heart makes a relationship with God possible. Just because you're breathing and living and thinking does not mean you have a relationship with God. At best, you have a heritage from God because He created you, but that doesn't mean you have a relationship with God. For that, it takes a pure heart. And so what is it that makes a pure heart? Well, the only way for a heart to be clean is for God to clean it up. Scripture tells us in the Old Testament that the heart, our, our, not the physical heart, but our spiritual heart, our will, our emotion, is deceitfully wicked. And the prophet said, who can understand it? Who can know it? It's desperately wicked, Isaiah said. And that all of our attempts to clean up our own spiritual lives are like filthy rags. We can't save ourselves. We are lost in sin. Isaiah 64, 6 says, We are all infected and impure with sin. When we display our righteous deeds, they are nothing but filthy rags. Like autumn leaves, we wither and fall, and our sins sweep us away like the wind. So the special promise of God here is this, that we can come to Him through Jesus' unique act of salvation, dying on the cross. He died on the cross for our sins, and if we confess our sins, He forgives us, and He then purifies us from the effects of sin, from all unrighteousness. 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So according to the prophet, where is unrighteousness? It's in our hearts. It's in our spiritual hearts. It's in our will. It's in our emotions. It's in that thing that says, that the sign says, don't do that. And the next thing you're doing is that. 
It's where the law says thou shalt not. And you say, huh, you ain't telling me what to do. I know none of you have ever acted like that, right? Trust me, I know what I'm talking about because I know Russell. He cleanses us from all unrighteousness. You can have a pure heart. It's a matter of confessing your sin and having him clean that heart, making it spiritually pure. And so we move to the second ring, the middle ring, if you will, and it's there that we find a good conscience. Paul said, not only a pure heart, but a good conscience. Conscience is that moral barometer that you have inside. It tells you whether you're doing right or wrong. And responding to that biblically is what we call integrity, or doing what you say that you'll do. It's a pure heart of integrity. Today, even integrity is a relative matter, is it not? Uh, I'm not about to make a political statement, but I, I want to make a commentary on what we see in life. Politicians and even presidents are judged on what these days? Their ability to govern, and integrity seems to have nothing at all to do with the job. Preachers discovered in extramarital affairs go right on with their programs. This is so different from what the Bible calls for in believers. A good conscience is available to those whose walk lives up to the talk. Emerson, the poet, said of Seneca, the philosopher, he says the loveliest things, if only he had the right to say them. That's the point here. A pure heart is only a place to start in the Christian life. That's the entry into Christianity, is when you pray that prayer that says, oh Lord God, I recognize I'm a sinner, and in me there is nothing good. And I realize that you are the one who is pure, you are the one who is good, and I confess my sin to you, and I ask you to forgive me for Jesus' sake. Jesus died so that his blood would cleanse all of those sins. And in answer to your prayer, when you pray that prayer of confession, God applies the blood of Christ to your sinful heart, to your darkened heart. And that heart becomes pure. Isaiah said it's as pure as the driven snow, like white wool. Pure. But listen, we go on from there and develop a good conscience by the way we act. Any conversion experience that still leaves you living a sinful life without a deep desire to change. How deep, Pastor? Like a drowning man wants a boat. That's how deep. Any conversion experience that still leaves you living a sinful life without that deep desire to change is not a conversion at all. Love only grows in a pure heart where right actions construct a good conscience. And then we move right to the to the bullseye. We move right to the center of what Paul is talking about. He's talking about, first of all, a pure heart. That's the entry level of Christianity. Then he's talking about what we do once we have that pure heart. We develop a good conscience by acting rightly. We stay connected to God and he teaches us what's right and wrong and we follow that moral barometer that says don't do wrong, do right. And what happens is suddenly, not so suddenly, almost imperceptibly, without you noticing it, you move from the outer ring of Christianity through the middle ring and right to the pure center of God's choice, which is a sincere faith. Faith is most often thought as being that quality of believing. We say, we have faith in Jesus. Now that's in the verbal sense. What is a verb? It shows action, right? We have faith in Jesus. We believe in him. But Paul here uses faith as a noun. It's the object of belief. Or what you believe. Simply put, a sincere faith is something worth believing in. It's not what you can manage to crank up inside of you. Oh, I've got faith in Jesus. Oh, i got better faith in Jesus. Oh, I'm gonna... It's not you reaching up. It's trusting that what God has given is good enough. It is more of a passive faith that believes 
that trusts in, relies on, clings to who Jesus Christ is, the Savior. It's the object. In Paul's context of opposing the false teachers here, he's holding up the faith. Not your faith, not my faith, not other people's faith. He was holding up the faith of who Christ is. He was saying that there's a time to be saved. That's where the pure heart comes in, the confession in Christ cleansing your heart. A godly way to live which develops a moral conscience, a good conscience, and a sincere or a genuine doctrine to guide them both. What's happening is we're moving from the outer edge of Christianity where we make a decision in a Billy Graham crusade. And uh, Billy says, now don't go away. Remember when he says that at, right at the end? He says, now, I, I don't want you people that have made this decision. I don't, want you to, I don't want you to leave yet. I got some materials for you, right? Isn't that what he says at the end of the crusade? What are the materials? He, he's going to show them how to live as a new Christian. You see, making the decision is not the whole thing. You know, when Elizabeth and I got to the point where we knew we were meant for each other, we talked about marriage. Well, she talked about marriage. I listened. I learned a lot. I really did. When I made the decision to ask her to be my bride, and she said yes, it was in a Chinese restaurant, right? And taking her out and special. I couldn't wait until we got out of that place. So I, I just, we were sitting in the booth and I asked her, you know. She got so excited she kissed the waiter. <laughs> <laughs> he, he was surprised though. He just, yeah, I made a decision to ask her and I bought the ring. Twelve dollars of it, I think. <laughs> I gave her that ring. She said yes. That was it, right? <laughs> Man, that wasn't it. It was good. Just like the decision of Billy Graham, it's good. But is that the end of it? Is that where you stop? Uh, Billy says, I got some more information for you. I want to give it to you. This is going to teach you a little bit how to live <coughs> and develop that conscience, a good conscience, because you're going to see what's right and what's wrong. God's going to lead you in that. But you know what? There's a little bit more. There's a little bit more to the Christian life than just being saved and acting right. Then it's time to have the sincere faith, to have the genuine faith, the truth to pass along to others. That's why we're here today. That's why I'm preaching about this. That's why you have Sunday school that follows here. And you ought to mature yourself in the Sunday school class as well. I'm going to take it further. I'm going to take it further. Paul gave this concept to <coughs> Hebrews as well. Basically what he said in Hebrews 6.1 is, if you think all there is, get saved and making sure your butt is in a pew on Sunday you're far mistaken listen to what he said let us stop going over the basic teachings about Christ again and again let us go on instead and become mature in our understanding surely we don't need to start again with the fundamental importance of repenting from evil deeds and play, placing our faith in God <coughs> not that that's bad that's good that's the entry point to Christianity <coughs> But it's only the entry point. Don't you want to grow? Wouldn't it be a terrible thing if an infant stayed an infant all of its life? What could it do besides fill a diaper and swill whatever is put in its mouth? And sleep. And cry. And change your life. <laughs> but no, you want that child to grow. You want that child to become an adult. Take that place in society that God is drawing that person to. You know, it's the same thing in the Christian faith and the Christian family. Some people manage to stay spiritual infants all of their lives and never go beyond. They're never willing to pay any of the price associated 
with becoming mature. Facing the truth, we have to admit this, just because a person is saved does not guarantee that that person is wise, or that he is immediately going to live the Christian life. Many people come to Christ with very little knowledge of the doctrines of the faith. Unfortunately, too many believers never make a serious effort to move past the basics of the faith. Not a matter of getting degrees in seminary or getting a certificate to hang on your wall so everybody will know how smart you are. But getting a deeper understanding of who Christ is and how he expects us to live is a matter of obedience and coming to the point of being a strong witness to honor Christ. That's our whole point. Once past the point of salvation, we have a responsibility to understand our faith. Now I'm going to close with two reasons why. Two reasons why we have a responsibility, not just to stay for Sunday school and be instructed in the faith, but a responsibility to go as deep as God will allow us to have our minds open. First has to do with freedom for me. And I'm not saying me as your pastor, I'm saying freedom for me. If Danny was saying this, he would say freedom for Danny, freedom for Barbara, so on and so forth. Freedom for any of us individually. So many believers live defeated lives because they have so little knowledge of the liberating reality of Christ. Paul says that a lot of people have missed this point, which means, the way he put it, is that they missed the mark. You know what missing the mark is? It's a three-letter word. It begins with S and ends in N. It's sin. Missing the mark is sin. God has said, here's the bar, and we miss the bar. We come short of the bar. All have come short of the glory of God. That's what sin is. Missing the mark. When I begin to understand the doctrines of salvation and the joy of my inheritance in Christ, I'm set free from the worry and defeat of all of this. Not just to feel the winds of freedom in my hair as I do whatever I want, but to experience just how wonderful the relationship to Christ becomes when I know how to please Him and honor my Lord and I begin to act like it too. That's freedom for me. That's real freedom for me. And now listen, there's the second reason. It's freedom for you. Freedom for everybody. Because we can pass it along. Paul says that those who missed the mark had turned to meaningless talk. That implies an empty result. Whenever the subject of spiritual things comes up, folks who don't know any better want to debate empty issues that end in fruitless controversy. Uh, that's going on in the United Methodist Church right now. An endless, endless, endless debate about homosexuality. God said it pretty clearly. It's not right. It's wrong. But if you want to debate this thing and debate it and debate it and debate it, and we don't have any bishops to stand up and say, well, wait a minute. It's wrong. We're not going to debate this. You're not going to bring this up at general conference anymore. It's wrong. Simple. Plain. Are there people hurt by that? Yes, there are. But you know what? There are people who are take offense at not being able to murder somebody else too. It's not a matter for us to decide who gets offended. It's up to us to preach the gospel. Freedom for you means that there's a right and wrong purpose of doctrine to discuss interesting but surface issues of Christianity while countless thousands of people, even in our own neighborhoods, are going to hell without Jesus. That's wrong. But to allow years of investigation, learning the faith to perfect our witness so that we can lead other souls to the throne, that's right. We need to get a little bit more black and white with this, folks. Some things are just not debatable. So listen, none of us can afford to be ignorant of the faith. People are more informed than ever. They've got the internet to tell them all sorts of truth and lies. People have a myriad of choices concerning religion. So if we are to remain as a strong witness for Christ, leading people out of darkness, we're going to have to do some things here. We're going to have to get used to the idea of going past the elementary doctrine of salvation, as Paul called it in Hebrews 6. We're going to have to stop talking so much about, well, do you get saved? Uh, 
by knowing this or that or the other thing? Is that person really saved? Do I question this? How many angels can sit on the head? We're going to have to go past all of this meaningless discussion. We're going to have to go past that outer ring of a pure heart. We're going to have to go in the next closest ring of the bullseye to living our lives in a holy manner, obedient, a person of good conscience. Remember in the last presidential campaign, the slogan, Make America Great Again? How about we apply that where it means so much more than whatever America is? How about making the church great again? How about making the faith great again? Not that it was ever not great. But listen, we've let the church die on the vine because of our timidity. We have to go all the way past the outer ring and the inner ring, all the way to the center of the bullseye. Because the person that hits the center of the bullseye, the love of Christ, takes the time to know Christ in an ever increasingly intimate way. We get to know his fellowship, we get to know his doctrines, we get to know his power, we get to know his suffering, we get to know the glory of Christ. Because we dig, we make ourselves available. And we know the priority over the material things of life as opposed to the faith of glory in heaven. The bullseye in Christian discipleship is to be a strong believer, grounded in Christ and in his word. Everything else is passing away. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. 513 is our hymn, Soldiers of Christ Arise. Let me ask you this question as you turn to 513 and we're going to sing that song. How many of you would like to send untrained soldiers into the battles? I don't think Christ wants that either. Let's stand together as we sing. First, last. 